first news of the week. Some sushi chains in Japan are dealing with pranksters. And I know, I know, this doesn't sound interesting, but follow me, I promise you this is important. Kaiten Sushi, in English, conveyor belt sushi, are cheap sushi restaurants where, as the name implies, you sit at a table and get your sushi from a conveyor belt that runs around the entire place, in addition to your normal orders. In recent days, the heads of two of the most famous chains, Akindo Sushiro and Hamasushi, have released statements saying they'll take legal action on a bunch of people that recorded themselves playing pranks inside their shops. These pranks usually involve touching or licking parts of the conveyor belt, plates, or other utensils of public use. Now, pranks like this have always existed, and they're kind of irrelevant in the big picture. So why are we talking about it now? Well, because since pranksters started posting these shirts on social media, in early January some of them went viral, and people panicked. So much so, that to describe these actions they created the word sushitero, sushi terrorism. Saying that this has been blown out of proportions is extremely reductive. Before the pandemic, Kaiten Sushi Places had already began the introduction of tablets and automated systems for ordering and checking out. With the pandemic, the prospect of labor shortages and, more in general, to reduce personnel expenses, these changes were accelerated and implemented in a majority of places. Customers can now effectively dine without interacting with a shop employee. But this also means that there's very little people watching over them. Thus, the alleged increase in pranking, but more on that later. Now that people are panicking, some chains announced they will change the features of their restaurants, with some places only putting orders on the conveyor belt instead of the usual buffet, and others installing protective screens and whatnot. If this panic continues, we might see some other severe changes to how these joints operate. But for now, let's talk reality and let's be honest with ourselves. If you want to eat good sushi in Japan, you go to a sushi bar, but it's expensive. If you want to eat cheap sushi, you go to a kaiden, but of course, the cheaper you go, the worse quality you're gonna get. While it's imperative that all businesses operate in the most safe and sanitary of conditions, of course, the delusion that a kaiten sushi, where raw fish rotates at room temperature in front of a ton of people, is as hygienic as a normal bar or restaurant is just that, a delusion. And the fact that something as common and trivial as a bunch of unsupervised customers playing pranks at a restaurant is creating headlines and is even being picked up by Western media is a big indicator of another huge omnipresent delusion when it comes to Japan. The delusion of a harmonious society. I'm using this phrasing because I read it on a headline and it made me laugh, but the concept of social harmony is a deeply rooted fallacy in the common thinking of a bunch of East Asian societies and also of how they are perceived abroad. There's the idea that society works like clockwork, that there are no outstanding social issues and that the people are a homogenous group with the same exact backgrounds, needs and desires. It is exactly the fallacy that leads all societies to trample on women, physically or neurologically divergent people, and more in general, all minorities. Do you think Japan is a harmonious society? Why don't you look into the condition of women, of immigrants, of LGBTQ plus minorities, or the disgusting situation of the Japanese justice and jailing systems? This harmonious society's concept is at odds with the very idea of democracy, which stems from acknowledging that society is made of several different parts with very different desires, and that the only way to preserve the rights and safety of everybody is to find common ground in what appears to be a chaotic mess of confrontation. This is also why, to me, Japan doesn't look like a democracy, but that's a topic for another time. There are plenty of analysis now on how this sushitero thing is all because of smartphones and social media and kids these days, etc, etc. And yes, okay, I'll give you that people who want to be famous might feel a little bit encouraged to do this and cause some emulation. But pranksters have always existed. Being able to record and share our every moment opens up a window on society that we didn't have before and shows it for what it really is. It's our image of society that has always been partial. We're not completely in our heads. Next topic, let's talk about the gays. On February 4th, Kishida fired another member of his government, this time one of his executive secretaries, a man named Masayoshi Arai. 
Arai was the Prime Minister's speechwriter, his spokesman, and was in charge of media relations. And on the 3rd of February, Arai told reporters that he would not want to live next to a same-sex couple, that he loathed even looking at them, and that people in Japan would abandon the country if same-sex marriage was approved. Which, if anything, is the opposite. Women and same-sex people are already fleeing the country to look for better conditions abroad. But to go back to what I was saying in previous videos about Kishida's choices for his entourage, does this look like a competent media relations manager to you? No wonder Kishida's been sinking in the polls for months. Anyways, Kishida immediately fired him on the 4th and issued a public apology on the 6th, saying that Arai's words were quote-unquote outrageous and completely incompatible with the administration's policy, describing the latter as quote-unquote respecting diversity and creating an inclusive society. But what the Prime Minister forgot to say is that Arai made those remarks when commenting on Kishida's own words a few days earlier. As a matter of fact, when asked about his stance towards legalizing same-sex marriage at a session of the lower house budget committee, Kishida said that the government has to exercise careful consideration because the issue could fundamentally change the views about family and values as well as society for all the people. Phrasing that from a Japanese person amounts to a loud and clear no. Kishida has been touting a more inclusive and equal society for a while now, but has failed to take any steps towards it. But most worrying is that this is not the first time a scandal like this happened. In a cabinet reshuffle last summer, Kishida appointed lower house member Mio Sugita as parliamentary vice minister for internal affairs and communications, again in a PR position. A person who repeatedly made discriminating statements against sexual minorities, who denies gender equality, and who said that same-sex marriage shouldn't be supported because those couples are not productive. And at the time, Kishida continued defending Sukita until he was forced to dismiss her at the end of last year. Therefore, Kishida's apologies and words on equality sound empty, if not outright lies. The cabinet hasn't done a single thing to advance gender equality or minorities' rights. But it's clear that with its appreciation polls already tanking, the Liberal Democratic Party now has to do something for shows. In the face of public outrage, Toshimitsu Motegi, LDP Secretary General, said at a news conference that the party will prepare a bill to promote public awareness on LGBTQ issues. Even though that's not really the point anymore, but let's put a pin on that. We don't know anything about the bill yet, except that we will not be about marriage equality. But it's worth remembering that another bill aimed at encouraging, understanding, and preventing discrimination had already been presented in recent times. It was a cross-party bill drafted in 2021, but it was never submitted to the parliament because the LDP tanked it. And the fact that the most recent bill still doesn't include marriage equality demonstrates not only how hollow Kishida's words actually are, but how much the whole LDP is out of touch with the Japanese society. A survey carried out by the Mainichi Shimbun and Saitama University from November 2021 to January 2022 found that all age groups except 70 plus are more in favor of same-sex marriage than not. Other opinion polls by the Azahi Shimbun showed that the ratio of respondents who support the proposal to legalize same-sex marriage rose from 41% in 2015 to 65% in 2021. And because the public opinion has already shifted, society is already changing to accommodate these demands. A growing number of local governments have already started a program to officially recognize same-sex partnerships. I talked about it in one of my previous videos. More than 250 local governments have already introduced these kinds of systems. The most recent one was the Tokyo Partnership Certificate Program. And altogether, these municipalities cover about 60% of the Japanese population. Meaning that society is already moving on. The whole civilized world has already moved on. And the only ones keeping the whole of Japan behind are Kishida and the terrible people he keeps surrounding himself with. And now, let's come to the radioactive topic of the day. God, I'm sure that even if my videos get very little views, I'll get a flock of nuclear bros storming in the comments. Yes. We're talking again about nuclear energy. 
more specifically about Japan's plans for its nuclear reactors. It's Wednesday news that the Commission of the Nuclear Regulation Authority, shortened to NRA, has not yet approved the government's plan to lift the 60 years cap on the nuclear reactor's lifespan. Under the current regulation, a nuclear reactor can be operational for 40 years, and if the request is approved by the NRA, up to 60 years. The decision to temporarily reject the government plans came with only one opposing vote out of five commissioners, since the decisions need to be unanimous, and the issue will be rediscussed on February 15th. Now, to explain why this is important, let's take a step back and explain what the NRA is. After the 2011 Fukushima triple disaster, the blame for the incident was rightly attributed to the collusion between the government regulatory agencies and TEPCO, the Tokyo Electric Power Company. At the time, the two agencies that were supposed to assess the safety of the plants were the Nuclear Safety Commission, controlled by the cabinet, and the Nuclear and Industrial Safety Agency, controlled by the Ministry of Economy. Given that the government had political and economical interest in promoting and deregulating the nuclear industry, the two agencies came to be seen as unreliable and without the due independence that a safety regulatory body should have. And therefore, in September 2012, the Nuclear Regulatory Agency was created and established under the Ministry of Environment. The independence of this body should be guaranteed by its commission, while inside the NRA, there is another body called the Secretariat that is chosen by the government and acts as a mediator supposedly under the NRA's control. Now, we can all agree that the independence of a safety regulatory body is important, right? Because when it's not, we end up like with Fukushima, where, as I said, the economical and political interest of the government caused the worst nuclear disaster in the history of Japan. So this begets the question, is the NRA really independent? And the answer is no, not at all. At least, I think it's not, and I'll explain why. First of all, because the NRA was created by merging the two other government agencies and by having those same people as members and commissioners of the NRA. Second, because as I reported in one of my previous videos, Kishida is planning to move the jurisdiction of the agency from the Environment Ministry back to the economy one, which will most certainly spell corruption and conflict of interest once again. And third, because the track record of the NRA already discredits its own claims of independence. I'll explain. In October 2022, the NRA had already took on the nuclear reactor's lifespan issue. Months before, Kishida made a flurry of announcements in what appears to me like a spray-and-pray tactic that lacks a coherent political vision regarding proposed reforms on the sector, from making the extension of the lifespan a decade-by-decade -decade decision to the removal of the limit altogether. Therefore, the NRA instructed its secretariat, again, the part of the NRA chosen by the government, to start the review of the lifespan regulations, which could already be taken as signaling the NRA's subjugation to the cabinet, but let's not be rash, I would have given them the benefit of the doubt. I would have, if only in the same period, the NRA Commission Chairman Shinsuke Yamanaka, allegedly independent, hadn't argued that the legal life of reactors is a matter of policy decision, outside his mandate. This would mean that the NRA hands out safety regulations inside the scope of government policies, and implies that its action is in line with the government promotion of nuclear energy, even if that would mean going against scientific guidelines. We can all agree on this, right? The moment the decisions of a regulatory body are not based on scientific proof, but on the views of the current government, it's not really independent at all. But if this wasn't enough, two months later, in December 2022, news came out that the Secretariat of the NRA actually begun talking with the Ministry of Economy since July, without reporting it to the NRA, nor keeping any records of the sessions. Incidentally, since summer 2022, the top three positions of the NRA Secretariat are held by former economy ministry officials. There were supposedly seven of these meetings, and they involved dozens of phone calls. After these revelations came to light, it was the usual theater of denials and counterproofs. The Secretariat initially denied talking about safety regulations, 
But then the Energy Agency confirmed that it told the NRA about considering a revision to laws under NRA jurisdiction, with the Secretariat itself calling for the deletion of certain provisions from the bill. Next, the NRA Commission Chairman Yamanaka argued that there is nothing wrong with the NRA staff discussing decisions with the ministers, since the final decision is taken by the Commission anyway. But journalists were quick to point that the NRA's own code of conduct states that the NRA performs its duties together with the Secretariat, stressing the importance for independence and transparency. As a result of this mess, the NRA told the Secretariat to keep records of future meetings with government departments. But curiously, the rule does not apply to phone calls. So nothing has changed. Having demonstrated how little transparency and independence the nuclear regulatory energy shows, you can see how recent moves by the government are very concerning. Shida and the LDP are unilaterally pushing for a revival of the nuclear business, and while we can in fact argue that that would have a positive trade-off by reducing carbon emissions, I would say that Japan is doing good without nuclear energy anyway. Statistics from the previous year show that in 2021, Japan's energy production came for 20.3% by renewable sources, 6.9% from nuclear power, and the rest from non-renewable sources. But instead of pushing for investments on renewable sources, the LDP stubbornly wants the nuclear business to be back in place. Still in the 2021 energy sources statistics, the renewable sources accounted for 0.5 percentage points more than the previous year, but the nuclear power was up 3 percentage points. As of December 2022, of the 60 commercial nuclear reactors in the country, only 10 had been restarted, 7 others received NRA approval to restart, and another 10 were undergoing safety inspections. The reactors undergoing decommissioning are 24, including 7 reactors at the damaged Fukushima plant. Talking about this topic always leaves me so miserable. By the rules of the internet, as a person in front of a camera, I guess I should have a clear opinion on the matter. But reality is much more complicated than that. I'm seeing the pros, namely decarbonization, but I'm also seeing all the cons, namely the people with the power to choose what to do with this technology. We'll see, I guess. That's it. I expect all of you to be very polarized on the comment section. No news analysis video this week, I wanted some time to work on my side projects and as you can see, I slightly changed the format here to also include more opinion, to make a sort of hybrid between the two. I'm Kay and this was Japan This Week. As usual, thank you for watching and if you like my content, please share these videos, leave a comment, like and subscribe. See ya!